sponsored by Skillshare. Hi guys, it's Clara. Welcome back. Before I get started, I wanted to quickly mention that today is Monday, November 2nd, meaning tomorrow is the U.S. presidential election. So if you're an American and you haven't voted already, please go vote tomorrow. It's super important. Today I'm here to bring you my October reading wrap-up. Am I finally back at the point where I can start doing monthly wrap-ups again instead of seasonal wrap-ups? Only time will tell, but I have a good group of books here, some really fantastic reads, and then a highly acclaimed book that I really did not like. So I'll save that one for the end and get started on a better note with an excellent and illuminating nonfiction book, which is The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. This book was originally published back in 2010, but all of the recent buzz around Wilkerson's latest book, Cast, gave me the push to finally pick this one up, and I'm so glad that I did. Wilkerson is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and in The Warmth of Other Suns, she traces the lives and migration journeys of three different individuals who all left the Jim Crow South for cities in the North at some point in the mid 20th century. Those three individuals are George Starling, who fled his hometown of Eustis, Florida to resettle in Harlem, New York, Ida Mae Gladney, who migrates from Chickasaw County, Mississippi to Chicago, Illinois, and Robert Joseph Pershing Foster, who leaves Monroe, Louisiana for the Golden Hills and Better Opportunities of California. And in following these three central characters, if you will, Wilkerson is able to capture three of the major geographic currents of the Great Migration. And in doing so, she's able to broaden our sense of the tremendous scope of this decades-long phenomenon that saw more than six million Black Americans move from the Jim Crow South to the urban North or West from World War I and into the 1970s. Prior to this book, much of the writing and scholarship around the Great Migration focused primarily on movement from Mississippi to Chicago. And I think it's especially interesting the way that Wilkerson frames the choices and behaviors and decisions of these Black migrants as being very much in line with the behaviors and patterns that you see in refugee or immigrant populations, which was one of the kind of major mind-shattering epiphanies of this book for me, although she does note that many of the migrants she interviewed really balked at the idea of being thought of as immigrants or refugees, particularly because many of their ancestors had been in this country since before its founding, but she evokes the horrors and the omnipresent danger and the daily dehumanizing indignities of life in the Jim Crow South in a way that makes you understand how migrating north for most of these Black Americans was not just a matter of moving across the country, but was in many ways a kind of escape. And she blends this beautiful narrative journalism with extensive oral histories. And she also, when touching on various aspects of the migration, will at times leave one of her three central subjects and give you a short video yet about another migrant's experience, be it someone like Jesse Owens who moved with his family from Alabama to Cleveland when he was a young boy, or Emmett Till who was a child of the Great Migration who was living in Chicago and like many northern kids was sent back south to stay with relatives during the summer when he was lynched in Mississippi in 1955. It's a phenomenal book and one of those clarifying reads where as you're going through it you can feel all of these disparate bits of knowledge and history clicking into place in your brain as you read it. And having this more thorough understanding of the Great Migration has already kind of started to reshape the way that I think about various aspects of 20th century U.S. history, which is fantastic. So I can't recommend this one enough. Next up, I have Displacement by Kiku Hughes, which is a graphic novel that follows a modern Japanese-American teen named Kiku who is visiting San Francisco when she experiences a phenomenon that she calls displacement, and she finds herself pulled back in time to San Francisco in 1942 when all people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast are being rounded up 
and sent to internment camps in various desolate locations throughout the United States. And so Kiku, finding herself in the wrong place at the wrong time, is shipped off to Topaz internment camp in the dusty, windswept flats of central Utah, along with thousands of other Japanese Americans, including her teenage grandmother Ernestina, who died long before Kiku was born and whose experiences of being incarcerated during the war had always been a kind of dark and little spoken of chapter in her family's history. And there are shades of kindred by Octavia Butler in this book, particularly with regards to the family time travel premise, but where kindred is underpinned by a lot of plot and a kind of central mission, the purpose of Kiku's displacement in time is less clear and seems throughout the book to be more about Kiku experiencing firsthand this family history that she had previously been cut off from. There's a gutting moment in the book where rumors are swirling around camp and Kiku realizes that she has no way to reassure her friends about what's going to happen because she herself doesn't know the history. And she says, being from the future meant very little when my education on the past was so limited. This is a YA graphic novel, which I didn't realize until the end of the book. Maybe the 16 year old protagonist should have tipped me off, but I only mention that because I do think this book is somewhat introductory and at times explicitly instructional in terms of how it talks about the history of Japanese Japanese incarceration, but I think that the way this book explores the silence that was often a hallmark of how Japanese Americans coped with the trauma of incarceration was really beautifully done. And I think its consideration of things like generational or inherited or community trauma is really haunting and something that I've been thinking about a lot since reading this. And the artwork is really stunning. I would say that the written narrative is good and then the visual storytelling in this book is really top-notch. Next up I have another book that explores the legacy of Japanese American incarceration during World War II and that is Sansei and Sensibility by Karen Tay Yamashita. This book has been billed as a collection of short stories that retell classic tales, particularly the novels of Jane Austen, hence the title of the book. And I would say from the outset that that is fairly misleading advertising. The first half of this book is actually a collection of stories and essays written between 1975 and 2019, most of which were previously published in various academic or literary journals. And so those early pieces in the book do have a somewhat disjointed feel, although they do all circle in one way or another around the Sansei experience, Sansei referring to third generation Japanese Americans. The term Issei refers to Japanese immigrants to North America, Nisei are their children, and then Sansei are their grandchildren. And generally speaking, the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II were the Issei and the Nisei, and Sansei were for the most part either extremely young in camp or were born after the war and became the children that had to reckon with the consequences and inherited trauma of the incarceration experience, which was often marked by a lot of silence and shame on the part of their Nisei parents. And the stories and essays in this book, and particularly in the first half, offer a farrago of prose styles and narrative registers. Karen Te Yamashita is such a limber writer in that way, and while I can see that contributing to a sense that this book feels very fragmented and disjointed, I really enjoyed just the capaciousness and versatility of this book. And the unexpected tonal shifts from flippant and satirical to these flashes of real sorrow or earnest emotion and reflection. I also really appreciated that Karen Te Yamashita has been writing around ideas of race and community and identity for long enough that her writing doesn't feel encumbered by the kind of heavy-handed exposition that I find to be a very 
uh, tiresome but very present aspect of a lot of today's cultural writing or first person essays that you find on the internet. In contrast, Yamashita makes no effort to over explain or define things that to her are implicit or self evident. And I found that to be so refreshing and energizing. I love when an author just kind of forces you to meet them where they're at and to really use your brain or Google if necessary. That being said, if you don't know that much about the history of Japanese American incarceration during World War II, it might be helpful to read a book like Displacement before diving into a book like Sansei and Sensibility, just to have a little bit more of the basic context for the themes and ideas that she's grappling with. I would also say as a caveat that the Jane Austen retellings, while delightful, are not particularly reverent of the source material. So Janeites maybe beware. But yeah, I loved this book. I found it so inventive and challenging in a good way. And I also just learned a lot, laughed a lot, and was occasionally quite moved while reading it. Next up I have The Lying Life of Adults by Elena Ferrante, translated by Anne Goldstein. This is Elena Ferrante's latest novel, her first novel since the conclusion of her Neapolitan Quartet in 2015, and her first standalone book since The Lost Daughter was published in 2006. This novel follows Giovanna, who is a teenage girl coming of age in Naples in the 1970s, and the book follows her progression through that fraught adolescent space between childhood and adulthood, between the onset of puberty and the moment of sexual awakening. And unlike the impoverished protagonists of the Neapolitan novels, Giovanna is the only child of fairly well-off and highly educated parents, and her father in particular is very much a part of the intellectual milieu of Naples, despite being from a fairly poor background himself. And the primary tension of this novel comes when Giovanna meets her father's estranged sister, Aunt Vittoria, and finds herself simultaneously repulsed by but pulled into the poverty and sharp accents and rough personalities of her father's neighborhood, the neighborhood that he has tried so hard to sever himself from. And there's a passage in the first Neapolitan novel, My Brilliant Friend, where the narrator Lanou is describing the horrors of puberty and the way that she feels her body expanding against her will and her hair growing coarse and her face getting greasy. And I remember I remember reading that at the time and thinking, wow, that's like too real. And this novel is basically that perfectly distilled passage expanded into a 330 page book. There was a recent New Yorker piece about Elena Ferrante and this novel that briefly toyed with the idea that this book was maybe a book that Elena Ferrante had written many years ago and only just now kind of dusted off for publication. And I would 100% buy that theory just because so much of this book feels very 1970s. And not just because of the setting, but because of the politics and the pseudo-sexual psychology and the second wave feminist ideas that undergird everything about this book. There's a lot of like Freud and primary attachment and the mother and penetration and psychoanalytic theory that actually reminded me a lot of Ferrante's first book, Troubling Love, which was published in 1992. And yeah, a lot of this book just felt like it was from a different decade. And although I found it to be a very engrossing read, I was very much pulled into the vortex of Ferrante's prose. A lot of it was very uncomfortable and unpleasant to read, which is the point, but I do think that this book is most interesting as kind of a piece of Ferrante's greater oeuvre. I don't necessarily think that it stands on its own in the same way that the Neapolitan Quartet or the Days of Abandonment do. And then I wanted to quickly mention Little Weirds by Jenny Slate. Jenny Slate is a comedian and actress who is perhaps best known 
known as being the voice and co-creator of Marcel the Shell. I'm also a big fan of her indie rom-com Obvious Child, and she also famously, at least to me, once described her ex-boyfriend Chris Evans as being, quote, like primary colors, his heart is probably golden colored if you could paint it. And that generosity and honesty and sweetly precise imagery is pretty much what you get throughout this collection of, I guess you would call them essays, but they read much more like stories that have sprouted from the abundant garden of feelings that Jenny Slate has about things like love, heartache, and cute woodland creatures. I can see her writing being a little bit too whimsical and twee for some people, and she does have a tendency to get a bit precious when she's talking about things like her art or patriarchy, but for the most part I really enjoyed listening to the audiobook of this. She narrates it and she has just some really lovely descriptions and unexpected turns of phrase. I was super taken with the writing in this book and particularly with the way that she writes so honestly and disarmingly about wanting to love and be loved. I also found her thoughts and fears about getting older to be extremely comforting in a strange way. So yeah, this whole book just feels like a warm hug. And I would say that Jenny Slate and maybe Cheryl Strayed are two of the only people whose unalloyed earnestness somehow works for me. The last book I want to talk about today is Real Life by Brandon Taylor, which is currently shortlisted for the Booker Prize. This is Brandon Taylor's debut novel, and it follows a grad student named Wallace over the course of a single weekend on the campus of an unnamed Midwestern university. Although I quickly realized that this is supposed to take place at UW-Madison, which I was initially very excited about. Unfortunately, I really didn't like this book, and the more that I read of it, the more it annoyed and exhausted me. Wallace is a black gay man originally from the South who is studying nematodes, and the book opens shortly after one of his lab experiments has gone horribly wrong, and the weekend that follows manages to feel both mundane and monumental, like it might be a kind of turning point or it might be just a brief pause before he goes back into the lab on Monday and starts the experiment all over again. Throughout this weekend, Wallace meets up with various friends from his program, although he doesn't seem to particularly like any of them all that much. And Brandon Taylor uses these different set pieces like a game of tennis or an excruciating dinner party as a way to focus in on the claustrophobic petri dish that is grad school life. And he looks at how things like race and class and sexuality create these complicated interpersonal tensions between Wallace and the other people trapped in the bubble with him. You really do feel like you're looking at this world through the microscopes of Taylor's prose. And just like you can see every tiny organism beneath a microscope's lens, Taylor really spares no detail or word when it comes to describing things that have no bearing whatsoever on the story being told. Here, for example, is a paragraph-long description of Wallace's friend's dining table. Typically, the table is pressed far to the wall, where it holds the articles of their lives. Dishes, laundry, newspapers, books, articles, notebooks, tools, cables, and whatever else could be discarded and forgotten. But today, they've drawn the table away from the wall into the large open room off the kitchen. Lucas draped a linen tablecloth over it, disguising its bruises, its nicks, specks of robin's egg blue from the painting of chairs, all this cartography hidden now. I'm exhausted just reading that, and to be honest, I found most of the writing in this book excruciating and at times unreadable. I know that that's really harsh, and I also know that a lot of people have really praised the sharpness of Taylor's writing, but I just found it to be so overwrought and so labored and so dense with excessive description and relentless similes. And there were just so many passages in this book that felt like MFA creative writing exercises. And on top of that, I also found the dialogue to be extremely clunky and unnatural, and there were several scenes and conversations in this book that felt really poorly paced and that hit these emotional climaxes way too quickly and in a way that felt very melodramatic. Which is interesting because I do feel like this is a book that is trying to be 
quite subtle and naturalistic and closely observed. And yet I found so much of it to be incredibly heavy handed and just like dialed up to 10 where a two or three would have more than sufficed. There were just so many moments when various characters, Wallace included, would say shit to each other that just stretched believability for me and that I didn't believe any actual friends out there would say to each other in that way. I think a lot of the ideas and sentiments that Taylor is trying to get at in this book, particularly regarding interpersonal dynamics, felt true at their core, and yet the way that he delivered them through his characters and dialogue felt just like a degree or two off. They didn't feel like real life, if you will. And then on top of that, the whole book also just kind of feels like it's wallowing in pain and forced profundity. Maybe the epigraph from the Book of Job should have tipped me off that this was going to be a novel about suffering with a capital S. <laughs> I don't know. This book does touch on things like violence and sex and trauma in a way that I don't want to be glib about, but I also haven't been able to fully work through my thoughts on those aspects of the book, in part I think because the execution just really didn't work for me. But I know that a lot of people out there really love this book and so I would be happy to chat more about it in the comments below. And lastly, this video is sponsored by Skillshare, which is an awesome online learning platform that offers thousands of courses for curious and creative people who are looking to explore their passions and develop new skills. I was recently introduced to a podcasting app called Anchor that I was interested in learning more about, and so I went onto Skillshare and took a class called How to Make a Podcast, which is taught by Anchor's head of production, John Lago Marcino. And the class had a lot of great tips about not only the kind of equipment that you need to podcast, but also how to do some of the more technical aspects of podcasting, including editing and audio mixing, which I found really fascinating and helpful. This class, like all Skillshare classes, included interactive projects and will also connect you to a community of millions of other online learners. Courses are designed to fit your busy schedule, and Skillshare is also one of the most affordable ways to learn online with annual premium membership coming in at less than $10 a month. If you're interested in exploring your creativity through Skillshare, the first 1,000 people who click on the link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Those are all of the books that I read in October. I'm going to link my nonfiction November TBR down below if you want to see what books I'm planning on reading next month. In the meantime, let me know if you've been reading any good books recently and let me know if you have thoughts on any of the books mentioned here. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!